Thank you, uh, Peter. I'm going to use a few pictures just to help me uh, in, in the talk. Uh, I think Carl set the, uh, the issue that we're talking about uh, very clearly, very eloquently. We're moving into a water-scarce uh, world. Um, and uh, we also are aware that uh, water is vital to agriculture. In fact, uh, on a global scale, 70% of all uh, fresh water extraction is used for agriculture. So that's uh, from rivers, from lakes, and from aquifers. Um, we know that the uh, demands for uh, water are growing from various sources, uh, uh, household consumption, uh, industry, power generation, even for, uh, for, for, for maintaining ecosystems, wetlands, and so on. Um, we also know that uh, food, the demand for food is going to increase, as, as, as Carl also mentioned, um, uh, not just because of population growth, although that is indeed the, the main contributor, but also because of uh, rising incomes. So given that uh, agriculture is uh, so dependent on water, that it's such a sh it uses such a large share of um, of these freshwater resources, which is uh, almost entirely irrigation. 99% is irrigation, small amount for livestock. So when we talk about the, the sort of freshwater share, we're not talking about the normal sort of precipitation on, on, on soils for, for rain-fed uh, agriculture. Uh, and and uh, given that, uh, that, that background, uh, how, is, how is this dilemma uh, going, to be, uh, going to be addressed? Um, and of course, it's going to be made even worse by climate change. Uh, does that work? Let me just see. Sorry, did I pass the did I pass the wrong? Uh, uh, okay, great. Sorry. Um, climate change is clearly going to um, have significant influence uh, on uh, water uh, availability uh, in terms of, for example, snow melt, in terms of river flow. Uh, it will affect precipitation, uh, both in terms of the overall quantity, but also the seasonal uh, pattern of, uh, of rainfall, which is going to have uh, big impl implications for the way farmers uh, manage uh, their land and, and, and pursue their, 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 their agriculture. And uh, of, it's also, uh, uh, we're told, going to lead to, to greater extremes in climate. And uh, while not wanting to make a one-for-one -one sort of causation in terms of recent floods, these pictures are from Bangladesh and from uh, th Thailand in the last uh, uh, two and three years, uh, it's clear that uh, we are facing into a much more unpredictable uh, climate future. There is a third issue uh, in terms of water, which is, of course, water quality, uh, which has perhaps been the issue that uh, has been uppermost in terms of water policy issues in the European Union up until now. Um, but I'm not going to say anything more about that, just to concentrate on the sort of uh, the quantity uh, issues. Oh. Uh, in terms of um, uh, areas of water scarcity, this uh, uh, map, I, I think, would, would, will not have any surprises uh, for you. Um, uh, it's clear that some parts of the world are under more pressure uh, in terms of water uh, scarcity or, or water stress uh, than others. Water stress is a concept where it's really looking at the physical uh, availability of water. So that's the sort of blue uh, uh, areas targeted uh, on, on the map there. Uh, you can see particularly North Africa, the Middle East, but also right across West Asia, uh, Central Asia, a little bit of Australia, and indeed, as David already mentioned, South Africa. Uh, so these are areas that are already under considerable water stress before we even look at uh, future demands for water and the impact of climate change. Uh, but then there are other areas where uh, physical availability of water may not be an issue, but economic access to that water, uh, simply the institutional constraints, uh, of, of course, are enormous, and large parts of sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia uh, fall into that category. Uh, to come to, to sort of the, the link with, uh, with agriculture, we essentially have two main uh, production systems. We have rain-fed agriculture, we have irrigated agriculture. Uh, in terms of the shares of land, uh, irrigated agriculture has been increasing quite uh, dramatically. The shares are not as such um, uh, um, shown there, but essentially around 10%, uh, if I can get it there, if I can get the, yeah, around 10% of uh, total cultivated area uh, in uh, 1961, uh, about 20% of total cultivated area uh, today. So we, we see that 
the, the, the area under, under, um, under irrigation has, has just over doubled uh, over, over this period, whereas the area under rain-fed uh, um, agriculture has, has really not changed uh, uh, very much uh, at all. In fact, it's very slightly decreased. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is the relative productivities of these two types of agriculture, where irrigated agriculture, because of the greater security of water supply, uh, uh, is uh, much more productive. So even though it has only 20% of the arable, of the cultivated land area, uh, it's, it contributes around 40% of, uh, of, of global uh, f uh, food uh, supply or crop supply. Um, and in fact, that's made clear on, the, on this slide here. Uh, the, Figure for arable land share is a little bit less than the 20, it's 15%. Um, uh, but the important figures are, are, are these here and in, in the middle. So we see that uh, the share of irrigated land and the production from irrigated land is expected to remain more or less constant. So it's going to grow in line with, uh, with uh, food demand generally. But uh, we see that uh, by, by uh, even currently, uh, around 60% of our total crop cultivation is coming from, uh, from irrigated uh, uh, land. So we are hugely dependent on that. And of course, the sustainability of that has come under question uh, in, many, in many countries. If we go back to this issue of water stress and we just look at the share of renewable water resources uh, which is used by irrigated agriculture in different parts of the world, uh, and the sort of stress um, uh, percentage uh, would be around 40%. Uh, for the world as a whole, over here it's about 6%. So no uh, real uh, uh, stress issue, if you like, globally, but of course, when you focus in on particular regions, and particularly look at North Africa, uh, uh, where even today, 170% uh, 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 usage of, of water as compared to renewable uh, resources. So implying huge um, depletion of underground uh, aquifers and, and the sustainability. It's happening in Belgium, but it's even, of course, more so in these arid uh, countries. But also look at West Asia, Central Asia, uh, well above the 40% uh, figures, which is deemed to be, uh, to, to, to be critical. So, th so there are areas of the world where uh, water scarcity is, is, is a problem today and going to become more so in the, in the future. What to do about that? Uh, uh, we might... Uh, sort of classify policies under, under sort of four headings. Uh, one is, is clearly to increase the productivity of rain-fed agriculture, that's 60% of the land. Uh, uh, secondly, to increase the productivity of irrigated agriculture. Uh, we can think about uh, uh, trade between um, uh, countries that, uh, that have water surpluses, if you like, and, 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 and countries that have water deficits. And we could also think, of course, and uh, Carl also uh, uh, made this point about uh, the limiting the sort of potential increase in demand through switches in, in, um, uh, in, 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 in diets and, and also through uh, uh, addressing food losses and food waste. So just a, a comment on each of those in terms of the, the rain-fed agriculture, which is hugely important because that's where predominantly the, the poorest smallholders live. Um, uh, so if we want to address uh, the poverty issue, again a point uh, Carl addressed in his, in his talk, um, uh, we really do need to focus on uh, improving productivity and, and water producti productivity in rain-fed agriculture. And uh, we're dealing in many cases here with subsistence farmers not well integrated into the cash economy. So we're th we have to think of ways that don't involve huge expenditures by, by, by families that simply don't have that, uh, that money ready. We can think of uh, uh, issues to do, issues such as uh, interventions such as uh, conservation agriculture, uh, agroecological uh, approaches, agroforestry, which is uh, mentioned, uh, shown here. We can think of uh, fairly low-key, low low-scale uh, ways of water harvesting so that we can actually try to save water when it falls in the rainy season to make use of it in, in, in the dry season. And I think an important role is going to be, uh, is necessary for plant breeding, uh, uh, both conventional and, and potentially uh, 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 genetic engineering for, for drought tolerance. If we think of the, the irrigated uh, technologies, um, 
uh, again, uh, we, we, we can't expand uh, irrigated the area very much. Um, uh, it, 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 we simply don't have the water in some countries. Uh, there are problems, increasing problems with large dams and, and uh, uh, environmental questions around that. So really the focus has to be on improving the productivity. And there is a good news story here because there is the potential. A lot of irrigated agriculture doesn't uh, operate at very uh, high levels of uh, productivity. That may require investment in upgrading infrastructure, as, as, as David gave the example. Uh, it will certainly require improved incentives, including uh, possibly water pricing, uh, uh, but also uh, improved management by farmers, uh, switching crops to make sure that the, uh, the irrigated water, which is more valuable, is, is used for high-value crops and, and, and so on. But also institutional reforms to improve the governance of of, of water, and uh, you know, David gave some very interesting examples, of, you know, related to the tragedy of the commons. And I just had one uh, example. You could give many, of course, in this area. But some of you, I don't know, Tom, if you have visited Lake uh, Naivasha in, in, in Kenya. Uh, but this is uh, a lake in the Rift Valley in Kenya, uh, a little bit north of Nairobi, uh, a very um, uh, uh, scenic uh, um, uh, area with uh, uh, quite an important tourist uh, business. But this is also the, the home of the Kenyan flower industry, uh, flowers as in uh, uh, roses and, 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 and carnations. Um, and around the lake, you have about 60 uh, flower growing firms, mostly uh, uh, owned by, by, um, by, by foreigners, uh, who are producing roses for the European market. In fact, if you buy your Valentine rose, it, there's a high probability that it has come not just from Kenya, but from this area. The problem, of course, is that uh, there is no regulation of the water use. Uh, we have uh, seen uh, a huge extraction of water for the flower uh, industry, which has potentially at least contributed to problems of uh, lowering water level, uh, um, um, uh, pollution of the waterways, fish kills, uh, loss of livelihood by other users of the lake in terms of fishermen and so on. Uh, I'm not saying this is the only issue because clearly there is climate change. Uh, the, the level of the lake has apparently fluctuated in the past. Uh, but it is a, an example of how we need to have, whether, you know, regardless of where the problem is coming from, how we do need to have some sort of institutional mechanism to, to regulate and to govern uh, water use in, in, in this particular lake and indeed in, 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 in other similar examples. Uh, virtual water trade um, is a, a, a concept which uh, uh, emerged in, in the scientific literature in, in, in the mid-90s. Um, and the idea here is that we can think of water as being, if you like, embodied in, in commodities. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of a virtual water. Um, and you can see that essentially water trade follows flows of agricultural commodities. So the big exporting countries, uh, North America, Latin America, Australia, are essentially exporters of water. Uh, to uh, um, uh, North Africa, uh, countries of Asia, uh, uh, and, and China. Um, the concept has been given quite a normative um, uh, angle in, 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 in political debate. A lot of people think that there's something wrong with trading water uh, in this way. Either uh, it's because uh, some countries are becoming dependent on imports of water, this virtual water, um, and that is seen as a bad thing. Um, or because, for example, when we uh, uh, consume our coffee, uh, we are, in a sense, uh, uh, consuming exported water from countries that perhaps, uh, the argument goes, could use that water uh, better at home. Um, I think uh, the concept is helpful in focusing attention on water use and the need for improvements in water efficiency. Uh, I think as a guide to policy, it can be extremely dangerous, and we might, we might debate that in the, in the Q&A, uh, but just to say that that is, is uh, uh, another way of, of addressing uh, the, the challenges of water scarcity in certain parts of the world. Finally, there's huge issues uh, to do, as, as, as Carl has, has already mentioned, to do with addressing uh, uh, food losses, uh, food waste. 
uh, the question of non-food uh, uh, uses of, uh, of agricultural resources. Uh, we don't have time here to go into these. Um, uh, some of these issues are addressed in the really excellent uh, Environment Nexus blog, which Linda and, and colleagues here at the Institute uh, uh, run. So just to, to finish by sort of saying that I hope I've given some uh, insights into the, into the fact that addressing the, the water uh, food security nexus is really one of the critical challenges, as indeed uh, the other speakers have, have highlighted uh, for us in, in, in the coming decades. Thanks, Peter. Uh, mm -hmm. Fabulous. Thank you very much.